Well, good afternoon, brethren, sisters, Church of God, which is the Church of the Living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Hello. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. Please read along with me, word for word, verse by verse, at the scriptures we will be looking at today. It's a little later than I'd like to get going. It's uh, 12.43 p.m. my time here in glorious Woodstick, Illinois. We're going to be talking about, for the remainder of this week, foundations. Because... Psalm 11. Please read along with me word for word, verse by verse, at the scriptures we are going to be looking at today. Read along with me. Be a Berean, search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Read along with me because sometimes the mouth goes quicker than the brain, okay? So you need to pay attention, okay? And it's about the scripture that we're going to be reading. Read along with me, okay? Please. <clears throat> But when it comes to this thing about foundations, we're going to be reading Psalm 11. So go ahead. But hold on. Have you seriously watched, listened, and looked at a majority of these Christian YouTubers? Have you? Now, there, I have encountered some that actually use the scripture, but they're not rightly dividing, okay? They're not, but brethren, saints, Houston, we got a problem, okay? What is the foundation for Christianity today? What is the foundation? And of course, again, what will the Christian tell you? Well, Christ is our foundation. Which one? Which one? Now this week, as I told you in the previous video, we are going to address more on the dispensations. Okay? But, as it was brought, as I was talking to a brother last night, and even today, which is why this took a little bit longer, um, Rightly dividing the word of truth is an imperative thing that you, saints, need to do. Okay? Christianity is not being taught to rightly divide the word of truth. Christianity, because of Catholicism, is being taught that the entire book of Scripture is written to you. To you. You know, there is something written for you, and there is something written to you. Okay? There are two different things. All right? All right? The entirety of Scripture is written for you. For what? Huh? What is it written for us? Well, we covered this in Monday's video, but we're going to cover this again. We, we, we are covering milk stuff here this week because, brethren, Christianity doesn't even have the basic milk okay it doesn't and the further we go we have to realize that it's not ever going to Christianity is never going to return to anything that resembles closely to the faith that was once delivered onto the Saints it's not it's not and people are out there talking about revival this and revival that. <laughs> nonsense. Nonsense. Okay? Absolute, total nonsense. All right? A revival is not coming. All right? But what do we have? The Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed. And is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is specific 
within the dispensation for how someone is made right with God and or is saved. There is a doctrine of godliness being separate and other than the world we are in today, which crosses dispensational lines. But as far as salvation, doctrine changes within the dispensations. Okay, and we're going to cover that probably Friday. But today, we're going to talk about, uh, we're, and we're going to keep this simple, very simple. Today, we're going to be talking about God. Okay, meaning, which one? Are these Christians making a reference on to which one are they trying to explain to you that they follow okay all right but our foundation that we begin off of is what Christ through the scripture all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay? All of Scripture is written for you. It's not all written to you. Okay? The mystery of God today is Christ in you, the hope and glory, hope of glory, and that we Gentiles have been grafted into that tree of the Jew. And see, a lot of people don't like to acknowledge this. But when it comes right down to it, there are two types of people. Saved and lost, yes, yes. But there are Jews and non-Jews. Okay? There are Jews, God's chosen people, the apple of his God of his eye. And those of us Gentiles that have been grafted in to that tree of the Jew. Okay? You're either a Jew, a natural Hebraic Jew, or you're a Gentile. Okay? All right? There is no option C there. All right? Now, there are the three uh, main kindreds. Ham, which are the Africans. Japheth, which are the Europeans, and Shem, which are the Asiatics, like the Chinese, Japanese, also encompassing the Hebraic people. But remember, the Hebraic people were taken out of Shem. Okay? You got to remember that. Okay? You can't be a Hebrew and be a Japhethite. You can't be a Hebrew and be a Hamite. It's impossible. Okay? Not even all Shemites are Hebraic. Okay? But the Hebraic people are those that were called out of Shem, directly, direct lineage onto the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? You got to remember that. Okay? But, dispensationally, doctrinally, all of Scripture is not written to you personally. It's all written for you, for you to learn from, for instruction in righteousness, reproof and correction and doctrine, yes. But the doctrine for us today specifically is found within the Pauline epistles. And see, as we discussed about in the previous video, what happens is, look at that, look at, the, look at Christianity, okay? Look at the Charismatics, okay? Uh, look at the Calvinists. Look at the Catholics, okay? Look at that. And, you know, this thing of sleazy believism is almost kind of an umbrella term. The believe and receive crowd, which likes to skip over scriptural brokenness and repentance, okay? Some of these guys are varying in degrees, okay? Some are a lot worse, like uh, like uh, the guy from Canada and that smacker jerk guy and the guy from New York, the Inquisitor from New York, and that whole mess, and that one idiot Tom and them two girls that he's with. Okay, th those guys are horrible at that. But then there is also another type of these sleazy believists that are not that bad as those guys. Okay, but see, sleazy believism has kind of fit its way into virtually all the denominations. It's very, it's very, 
very peculiar to see when you are looking at some of these Christians and just observing their comments and what they're talking about. It's, it's very, very peculiar. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Okay? But, as I'm telling you, Scripture is written for you, for you to learn, for you to grow, but doctrinally it is not all written to you. And that's where rightly dividing the word of truth comes in. But see, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Christian, who is a follower of Christ, which one? Which Christ? Now, you will say, there is only one Christ. And you are right. There is only one Jesus Christ. But remember, the word Christ itself means what? Anointed one. And do, do we need to go deeper into that? There are many antichrists today. Uh, uh, how many times have you heard, well, this is an anointed ministry? Really? Mm -hmm. And the charismatics are really bad about this. Oh, the anointing is on me. Well, if you were saved, um, that anointing, the Lord himself, is with you permanently. But see, charismatics, Pentecostals primarily, uh, also kind of an umbrella term, um, they believe that the Lord comes and goes, comes and goes, as if they were under the law. Okay? The purpose of this video is for we to give you some of these things, because remember... When you're talking to a Christian, the Christian is going to at first believe that you and they are serving the same God. And nine out of ten of these, not all of them, praise the Lord for that, not all of them, not every one of these Christians has bought into the nonsense of this stupid Ridiculous, <coughs> satanic, <coughs> trinity. Okay? Praise the Lord for that. Not everybody has. But, nine out of ten of these Christians that you're going to run into, nine out of ten of them, do believe in this stupid, ridiculous, satanic, nonsensical trinity. Okay? So, if your foundation for your Christ, that you're a Christian, that you serve, is one of three persons, Christian, look at me. You're not serving the right God. You're not serving the real God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there will be links for you in the description box to uh, go over this thing about who God actually is. Okay? All right? The Trinity is satanic. However, the Trinity as you Christians are taught does appear in the Scripture, though. Hold on, we'll get there. But first, Psalm 11. Come on. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, here's what you do. Okay, you, you take your little pen. When you come across the word if in Scripture, that's usually very significant conditional clause. Okay, very significant. So what you do is you take your little pen and you circle that word if. 
And you know what? If you really want to compound it, you go ahead and take your little Sharpie gel here. Don't use a marker, especially if you got a Cambridge or a really good set of scripture with like India paper on there because a marker will bleed through to several pages. This kind of does bleed through, but nowhere near as bad. And it preserves the, the scripture, the paper and whatnot. But what you, what you do is you take your little Sharpie gel there and go ahead and mark that verse. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And Satan, through Christianity, okay, through Christianity, has tried desperately to destroy the foundation. Why? How? By giving you Christians a false foundation to build upon. A foundation made of sand. We're going to address this. But if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And look at verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple, showing you a dispensational difference. Okay? This is what is called our instruction in righteousness, and we are going to look at this today as well. Okay? We are. We're going to look at this today as well. Today, God does not dwell in temples made by hands. You, if you are saved, if you've come to the Lord on His terms, okay, broken, contrite, and in fear of Him, you called upon His name, and He saved you. You are sealed with the Lord Himself, the Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, okay? All right? Not a building. Christians, for the most part, are all about going to a building. That's Catholic. Okay? That's Catholic. You have to remember, okay, brother, sister, when dealing with these Christians, you have to remember they're being taught Catholic doctrine. Okay? And yes, sleazy believism is a Jesuit creation out of Vatican II, okay? Sleazy believism is a Catholic Jesuit creation, okay? It is not a scriptural doctrine. It is not, okay? Don't fall for these idiots, please, please, okay? I know, they, they preach to you something that gratifies your flesh and it makes you feel good because there's no death. Oh, sure, they talk about the death of Christ on the cross, but where is the death of self? They, they offer you a, a gospel with no death of self. Totally contrary to Scripture. Okay? But verse 4 shows you the dispensational difference because under the law, which was faith and works, okay, God was in physical temples because God was not a permanent resident within the believer as he is today. Okay? So... The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth, trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. God has a soul? That's what that says right there. Oh. God has a soul. More on that in a little bit. Let's continue. Okay? Upon the wicked he shall rain snares. Fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup, which comes from Rome. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance, remember, countenance is the bodily, visage is the face, okay? For his countenance doth behold the upright. Foundation. What is our foundation? Our foundation is Christ. And the Christian will say that too. But when you talk with, when you can get it out of them, okay, they'd like to like to resist 
trying to, well, well, which one? Which one? Usually when you present that to a Christian, it's like, okay, Christian, what Christ are you serving? They'll look at you like, well, the Christ of the Bible. Oh, boy. <laughs> which one? Okay? It's, 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 see, it's, see this, this is what it is. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Okay? You understand? Okay? Uh, getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Now you got to remember. Matthew chapter... Matthew... Matthew 5, 6, 7 doctrinally are for the kingdom of heaven. Which we're going to take a look at a little bit today. Because we are going to look specifically in the book of Revelation to show you Christian, who is a Trinitarian, where your God is and who your Christ actually is. It is not the Christ of the scriptures. Okay? But, doctrinally, check out some of that. that don't, don't, I mean, if the Lord leads you to drop a verse of scripture, just, just drop a verse of scripture and see what will happen. Okay? But, I mean, when you look at some of these Christian channels and their comments, it, it, it's, I mean, I, when I look at it, I sit here, I'm like a deer in the headlights look, like a Mark the Messenger. It's like, what, what, what do I do? What? Where, where, what? what? <laughs> it's like, how, how? How? Okay. How can you begin, right? Like this. Like this. Matthew chapter 7. Remember, Sermon on the Mount is beautiful. Instruction in righteousness, mwah, voila, yes. Doctrine. Faith is mentioned one time in the form of a rebuke. Christ had yet to die, bury, and rise again the third day according to the scriptures. Doctrinally, the law was still binding because the perfect sacrifice for sins had yet to be made. And it's all works. It's all works in the Sermon on the Mount. It's all works. Faith is mentioned one time in the form of a rebuke and nowhere in the context of where it appears. Read the read Matthew 6, uh, read Matthew 6, uh, 5, 6, 7 on your own time today. Okay, go ahead. And nowhere in the context of where the word faith appears is it anything to do with the death, burial, and resurrection. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is all works. Okay? I've talked to you, we've talked about this at length. Okay? But see, this milk, simple, nuts and bolts stuff, Christians don't have. They don't. Okay? It's all about their feelings. Okay? They don't have the basic foundation. 24 on to verse 27. And right away, here, here, look. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, doing them, okay, today, I know a lot of uh, saints have uh, struggled with this, but the fact is, okay, when you go to the Lord and He saves you, you go to the Lord on His terms and He saves you according to His terms, not your own. You're once saved, always saved. God is not taking a loaded gun to your head, forcing you to live your life according to Scripture. You have to make the right choice. You can be a saved saint and totally ruin your life and still go to heaven. 
How would you ruin your life by not adhering to the scripture? Denying the Lord scripturally, hence he denying you with blessings, mercy, kindness, your testimony will be shot. But then again, see, when you get up at the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord's going to be ashamed of you. And see, these devils work off of that premise, well, I'd rather be in heaven with the Lord ashamed of me. But see, then again, they're offering you a totally different Christ. Okay? you got to be aware of this. All right? But right here, do with them. Look, brethren, I know some of you struggle with this. The fact is, salvifically, you do not. I, I don't like to say it, but it is the truth. You do not have to do anything he says. Why? Because if he's forcing you to do it, then you don't have free will, do you? Okay? I know you don't like to hear, I don't like to say that, but that is the fact. There are going to be saints up there who wrecked their life because they decided to disregard this and live according to their feelings. They have zero fruit, they are an embarrassment to the body of Christ and to the Lord, but yet at the same time, when they die, they're going to be with the Lord. Now, you and I as saints living in accordance with scripture to us we're like how could that happen it can it can and remember if it gets too bad in a saint the lord will kill you okay to deliver such a one over onto satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the lord jesus okay there are a lot of these devils out there who are not saved who are banking on that truth, okay, and hence deceiving people, okay, just, they're horrible, but, there again, they are not saved themselves, okay, because ye shall know them by their fruit, all right, a saint, internally, won't deny the word of God. They, will pro they, they can ignore it and choose not to adhere their lives to it. But at the end of the day, a truly saved saint has the Lord within them. Hence, you can't really deny when you have the Lord living within you. Okay? You don't have to do what he says. And you are going to pay a heavy price for that when you don't want to. Okay? But see, this is a dispensational difference. During the kingdom of heaven, it's all works. All works. What is faith? What is faith? Okay, hold your place here and go to Hebrews 11. Okay? This is simple stuff. But brethren, Christians don't know this. They don't. They don't. And you know what? Most of them don't want to. But see, that doesn't absolve us from our duty, our responsibility to tell them the truth. If they don't want to hear it, that's on them. Okay? But Hebrews 11.1 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. <laughs> the evidence of things not seen. <laughs> That's what faith is. <laughs> okay? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. We can't visibly see Christ himself today. They saw they saw God in the Garden of Eden. The faith wasn't... Oh, this is so horrible. Uh, these, these sleazy believers, idiots. Okay? Faith wasn't 
necessary in the Garden of Eden. They saw God, okay? Uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, okay? The kingdom, this, this isn't funny, but it's laughable. The kingdom of heaven, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, ruling and reigning at Jerusalem. People, listen to me, okay? Okay, these, these evil, evil, disgusting, sleazy believists, okay, they're, they're, just stay away from them, okay? They tell you stuff like it was by grace through faith in the Garden of Eden. They also tell you that it's by grace through faith during the kingdom of heaven. Oh! Christ is going to be on the earth during the kingdom of heaven. He's going to be physically sitting on a throne that's east in Jerusalem. You will be able to see Jesus Christ with your own two or four eyes. Okay? People. People. Please. Use a little common sense. Get your head out from betwixt your buttocks, please. You don't need faith during the kingdom of heaven because you are going to be able to see Christ with your eyes. Both of them or all four of them, okay? Don't believe these stupid, easy believism heretics who tell you it's by grace through faith throughout the entirety of scripture please and you know what the Christians not all of them the Christian channels that I have been just surfing around and looking at the ones that I'm encountering and watching and looking at not really watching but just observing by grace through faith from the beginning and they're not all just easy believists some of them are Methodists and even some Baptists. Okay? Alright, so, during the kingdom of heaven, you're going to be able to see the Lord. This physically see Him. That's also when the unpardonable sin comes into play. Dear, my dear young Hamedic sister, who I have given you links, I have explained it to you through scripture. You don't want to believe it for some reason. Why? I don't know. And see, when you got someone who's trying to justify themselves by keeping the law, that, that's a pride issue. That's a pride issue. I, dear young sister, I would seriously search the scriptures whether or not you are truly a saint. I really would. Okay? But anyway, I have given you the links. I have scripturally explained it to you, okay? And to anyone. The unpardonable sin is only applicable when Jesus Christ is physically present, okay? Christ is the only one who mentions it. Paul doesn't. John doesn't. Luke, uh, Luke whatever, um... But, you know, in the gospel accounts, the Lord himself is the only one who mentions the unpardonable sin as it's referred to. Okay? Paul doesn't talk about it. Peter doesn't talk about it. John, in like 1 John and stuff like that, he doesn't talk about it. Okay? Only the Lord. It's only, listen to me, it's only applicable, applicable when the Lord is physically present. Okay? You do not have to worry about committing the unpardonable sin today. Okay? You don't. There are links on the channel where we talk about the unpardonable sin that you don't have to worry about that today. Why? Because Christ himself is not physically present on the earth. His body, we, the saints are, but he himself is not. He will be at his second coming going to have to have something to worry about. Okay? Alright? So please. This, this is, see, and 
this is all a result of Christianity. Number one, basing their faith off of a false foundation made out of sand and not rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's continue here. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him, liken him unto a wise man, wise equated with fear of the Lord, wisdom, which built his house upon a rock. And that rock that followed them was Christ, not Dwayne Johnson. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, see again, works. Okay? This is instruction in righteousness. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, and a fool says in his heart, there is no God. And if you're behaving foolishly, you are acting, behaving, speaking, as if you say in your heart, there is no God. Okay? <clears throat> and everyone that heareth these saints of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Like I told you, you look at sand under a microscope or something like that, or you just get sand in your hand. And, you know, it's a bunch of little pebbles, a bunch of little stones, okay? Compacted together, okay? Sand is unstable. Sand, you sink, you move. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them, okay? See, the God of Christianity, which is a trinity, is a foundation built on sand, not upon a rock. Okay? Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. As we ended Monday's video uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let's pick up a little here. Okay? Verse 10, and let's read... On to verse 17. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how, how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now, one of these Christians wanting to defend that term Christian will say, well, see, see, it says right there. Okay, but see, you're not answering what Christ you're talking about. Brother, I know you're a Trinitarian. That's one of your big problems. I know that. I know you're a Trinitarian. I know. So when you talk about the Christ that you want to align yourself with, you're talking about a demoted Christ. Because what happens? You go to a Trinitarian and you say Jesus is the Father, their reaction alone tells you, shows you the level of mind control and brainwashing that they have endured at the behest of Rome. I've experienced, we've experienced it, personally. If they had a weapon, a gun, and you say to some of these Christians, Jesus is the Father, he's not the Father! That, that, um, ex, uh, what's that, that crazy Englishman, um, ex-Catholic guy, who went through all that palaver to defend the Roman Catholic Trinity, okay, he never left Rome, all right, even though he reads the scriptures, okay? He was like that himself, but even he, he composed himself a lot better. He was like mortified, insulted that saints, scripture calls Jesus Christ the Father, okay? See, a Trinitarian doesn't have 
the real God. Okay? You don't. You believe that your Christ is one of three persons. One of the, and it's the one in the middle. Which you say is not the Father or not the Holy Ghost. And you read First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians, chapter three. Read the whole chapter, verse seventeen, uh, specifically. The Lord is that Spirit, meaning the Holy Ghost. Okay. See, Christian, Trinitarian. When you say, "Well, I'm a Christian. I follow Christ," which one are you talking about? You are talking about a three-person satanic counterfeit. Okay? And you are describing an inferior God that's, note the finger here, in the middle. You are demoting God, Trinitarian. You are. Oh, and you're, see you're seething with anger right now, aren't you? Aren't you? Okay? I'm very aware of all your arguments, too. Okay? Granted, uh, I, I, I can't, I mean, I'm not the best at it, but this, see, this isn't rocket science. And when you look at these guys like that David Wood guy for, my, his goodness, okay? Trying to explain a three-person trinity is a you you get your mind goes numb just thinking about it and then <coughs> that one uh, Catholic Bob not the one from England but that <coughs> that Bob Barron guy okay that Jesuit priest he says the trinity is meant to confuse you God is not the author of confusion excuse me sorry about that you ain't stopping me okay all right, that Bob Barron guy, that Jesuit guy who did that uh, thing, it's like, well, the Trinity is meant to confuse you. Uh, God is not the author of confusion. And you're right. The Trinity is nothing but confusion. I, I, I love seeing Muslims, I, I do, and atheists just annihilate Christians, especially about the Trinity. It's, it's, I gotta admit, I enjoy seeing it. Because the, the Trinity is so satanic. Okay? But see, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Okay? And when, hold your place here. And when you go to, what is that? Uh, Second Corinthians... 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, or is it 1 Corinthians? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 1 on to verse 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And we're all baptized unto Moses, identified, in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink of, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual capital R rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Christ is the rock. He is the foundation. Okay? Jesus Christ, He is the Father. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We're going to look at the appearance of Godhead, which is, has nothing to do with a trinity. Nothing. Okay? You Christian of Christianity, the Christ that you are claiming to be a follower of is a demoted number two God in a three-person trinity. Okay? Your foundation is a foundation built upon sand. You don't even have the right God. You don't. You don't. 
Let's keep reading. Now, if any now here Catholics like to go to this talking about purgatory. This will have nothing to do with purgatory. Okay, this is talking about our rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, a stubble. Okay, gold and silver, precious stones. They can abide fire. Now, yes, gold and silver can be smelted down. Yes, but a going through fire initially, it takes quite a bit of heat to smelt gold and silver. Precious stones, such as jade, onyx, diamonds, and well, diamonds are actually overpriced for what they actually are. Um, you know, they can abide fire. Wood, self-explanatory, Hey, good kindling, stubble, okay? Every man's work shall be made manifest. It's the works that we saints do for our Lord, which talk, we just talked about in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 on to verse 10. Okay? We are called on to good works. See, at the judgment seat of Christ, us saints... The judgment seat of Christ is for the saved who get called up of this dispensation. After that, it's the great white throne. Okay? After that, the judgment seat of Christ is specifically for saved saints. Okay? All right? But, <coughs> every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. And Jesus is the day star. Okay? Because it shall be revealed by fire, and shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall see receive a reward. Such as works such as gold, silver, and precious stones. The work of uh, preaching the gospel. Living of the gospel. Being ambassadors for Christ. <clears throat> if any man's work shall be burned, done out of your own self-interest. Uh, flesh driven popular opinion driven <clears throat> he shall suffer loss because what what is the foundation that you're uh, basing your works on okay the glory of the Lord or to pump yourself up hmm? okay if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved Yet so as by fire, eternally secure. <coughs> what gets burnt up, what gets judged at the judgment seat of Christ is our works, not our salvation. Okay? That's why you really want to be saved now, today. Okay? Because... When it gets to the great white throne of judgment, which we're going to look at today, um, the dynamic is different. Okay, you're going to be judged salvifically for your with by your works, whereas you go to the judgment seat of Christ, you, you're saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ, sealed into the day of redemption. You get to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to go to heaven. But see, you're gonna have, you're gonna go to the judgment seat of Christ, and your works are gonna be judged. Okay. All right. And there, you're gonna find out whether or not the Lord is going to be ashamed of you for all eternity, or say, "Well done, good and faithful servant." Okay. And see, the devils again base a lot of what they do as well. At least I'm in heaven. Well, no genuine saint, no genuinely saved individual that I have ever talked to is okay with God being ashamed of them. Say, so, well, what do we have? We have it's like, well, you know, I don't want him to be ashamed of me, but. I mean, he probably will, but I don't want that. And we as saints, we strive not to, to, that God would not be ashamed of us. 
okay? But see, if you have this mentality, well, at least I'll be in heaven. Uh, he might be ashamed of me, but again, what Christ are you talking about? What Christ are you serving? And see, when you got that kind of mentality, the, the honor of the Lord means absolutely nothing to you. You, you shoot yourself in the foot every time. <clears throat> again, uh, really good, and I'm not going to say that guy's name unless he, you know, makes himself known. That one guy with his two brides, okay, he's got that mentality himself, okay. He's not serving the true Christ, okay. Verse 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, saved people, and that the capital S, Spirit of God, dwelleth in you, if any man, including yourself and that any, defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, separate other, which temple ye are. Okay? All right. See, Saint. We have the Father dwelling within us. The Lord Jesus Christ, you know, the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that Spirit. Trinitarians who believe in a three-person God, they don't have God living within them. You don't. You may think you do. Satan might deceive you in thinking and giving you like, oh, you can speak in tongues or some nonsense like that. Um, you don't, you're not serving the right God. Your foundation is flawed at the onset. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 12 on to the close of the chapter. Now, this is in context of saved people. People who were once lost, broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord, came to Him, called upon His name, and he, they were sealed with that spirit of promise. Uh, verses 13 and 14 in chapter 1. Okay, This is in context to saved people. The, the only way you can have God live within you is if he saves you and seals you with himself. Okay? Alright? You're, you're, not, you're not saved because you think you're saved. Okay? So, that at that time ye were without Christ before we were saved, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, like, we, like I discussed with you before uh, in this very video. See, we Gentiles have been grafted in to that tree of the Jew. Okay? That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, the blood on the cross. The cross, okay, all right, which is first death. And see, again, these wicked, sleazy believers, they do talk about the cross, but see, they like to avoid their own personal death, okay? Hence, they're not saved, okay? But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, Jew and Gentile, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, Jew and Gentile, one new man, so making peace. 
and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity, the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh, afar off the Gentiles, them that were nigh, the Hebraic Jews. Okay? For through him we both have access by one capital S spirit unto the Father. Look at that verse. Through him, Jesus Christ, we both have access by one spirit, the Holy Ghost, unto the Father. See, that's person. Um, hey, genius. How in the wide world of sports entertainment, how in Hades do you get out of verse 18 three persons? Where is that? Show that to me, please. Okay, show that to me. Where is it? Where is it? Huh? Where is a mention of three persons? It doesn't exist, buddy. It doesn't exist. That's philosophy and vain deceit. Let's continue. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. With the saints. You know, call, call yourself a saint. Call yourself a uh, church of God. Call yourself a believer. But see, when you want to cling onto this thing with a death grip, which Christ are you talking about? Which one are you talking about? And the majority of Christians that you will encounter, when you ask them that and they go to give you an answer, they are describing a foundation built on the sand. They are describing the Trinity, which is contrary to Scripture. Most of you Christians aren't even looking at serving the true real God. No wonder you don't rightly divide. Because the Christ you're serving is not Christ. Oh! Anointed! By who? By who? Now therefore ye, ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Christ is our foundation. Okay? He is our rock. He is the rock. He is the cornerstone. He, <coughs> he is what the faith that was once delivered unto the saints is built off, off of. What Christianity is built off of is built off of sand. A three-person nonsensical satanic trinity. You don't have the right God. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. There's another verse really good showing about how the Lord dwells within you. Okay? The Lord. You know, Jesus Christ the Father and the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that Spirit. One God. Okay? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. One verse again. 2 Timothy chapter 2, just one verse. That thing about the seal. Okay? We, we covered this in Monday's video. Nevertheless, the foundation, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. 
having this seal, sealed until the day of redemption. Okay? The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. See, the majority of Christianity, their Christ is the second person of the satanic trinity. And they get offended. And if possible, they would kill you for daring to... Like, okay? I went... Don't, don't do this. Okay? Don't do this. When in person... I've done this quite a few times. Quite a few times. <laughs> Scared my wife. <laughs> but when I talk to people, mano y mano, and the trinity comes up, I go, I purposely will spit on the ground in front of the Trinitarian when talking about the Trinity. I will. Don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> okay? I, I'm not telling you to do that. That's what I do. It gets the point across incredibly. Okay? Incredibly. And plus it shows them, the Christian that you're talking to, that, hey, you and I don't serve the same God. Okay? Like I said, I don't recommend you do that. Okay? I do that. <laughs> I do that. It gets the point across. Okay? I don't do that all the time. I don't do that all the time. But I will, when the Trinity comes up, I will immediately start throwing dung on it. <laughs> immediately. And that, of course, unfortunately, will get the Christian defensive. And when they get defensive, their hackles get... Uh, uh, go up a little bit. But you know what also happens when you put someone on the defensive? They're more perceptive to hear what you're saying but not let it sink in. Does that make sense? Any of you who have witnessed any of these people, you know what I'm talking about. Okay? But the foundation of God standeth sure having this seal. Those of us saints who are saved we are sealed until the day of redemption. Why? Because we are built upon the foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Okay? Okay? Now, let's look at a couple examples here. What is this built on sand? The Trinity. Revelation chapter 16. Now, the word Trinity itself does <laughs> not appear in Scripture. It's nowhere to be found. And, but a three-person, a three-person God who is purporting within himself to be one God, we're looking at this. And incidentally, what is a person? Okay? And here, here's another incident where you get your little pen or you get your little Sharpie gel here. Okay? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What is a person? You look on Google what a person is. Oh, wow, dude. You get philosophy and vain deceit. You know? It's, it's, it's like, uh, no. What is a person? Here's the best scriptural answer. To what a person is. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit, soul, and body. That is what a person is. Now, when the Trinitarian says God in three persons, they are telling you that there are three spirit, soul, and body that make one God.
That's insanity. There's also another good place that you can go to to tell you uh, that demonstrates what a person is. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Again, get your little sharpie and get your little pen and mark this verse. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. Now, it doesn't specifically say body, but atheist, what are joints and marrow equated onto? Come on, we know, a body, okay, a body. So you see in Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's another good verse to show you what a person is. Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? That's what a person is. Now, <clears throat> Revelation 16, verses 13 on to verse 14. Check this out. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon. Somewhere on the channel, there is a video that we talk about the plagues of Egypt, and we talk about the frog goddess of Egypt. Okay, it was a female deity. She had the face of a frog, or that, or that might be on the backup channel. But we address this somewhere. I'll try to find it if I can remember. But, and hey, if you've ever had frog legs, huh? <laughs> and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, and you can make the tie into Exodus with this, come out of the mouth of the dragon. And out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Hmm. Look at that verse. Dragon, beast, false prophet. What is it, three persons? Well, it doesn't say person there. Oh, you're right. It says three uh, unclean spirits like frogs. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Hmm. So the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Alright? Now, <clears throat> Revelation 19, Revelation 19, verses 19 and 20. And I said, now, two are described here, but we're going to look at some other verses, because we just saw in Revelation 16, the dragon, and who is the dragon? That old serpent, the devil, and Satan. The beast, that man of sin, that man of sin, the son of perdition, and the false prophet is also going to be a man. Okay. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, 
burning with brimstone. Now that's talking about the beast and the false prophet. But look, let's go to Revelation 13, verses 1 and 4. Okay? Revelation 13, verses 1 and 4. And I saw upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, the dragon gave him his power, his seat and his seat and great authority. Look across in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. <clears throat> and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Let's read verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ, anointed one. Okay, there's another verse that shows you what Christ means. Okay. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The dragon. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. Satan gives power unto that man of sin, the beast. Okay? Verse 3 in uh, chapter 13. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to more make war with him? So, during the time of Jacob's trouble, people are going to be worshipping the dragon through the beast. Hmm. And what do Trinitarians say? The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, and the Holy Ghost isn't the Father, or the Son, or whatever nonsense their little limerick is. Okay? Alright, now, skipping, skipping a little, let's look at verses 11 and 14, on 14 in Revelation chapter 13. We have seen the dragon. We have seen the beast. Verses 11 on and verse 14. And I beheld another beast come up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake like a dragon. <coughs> dragon speak. How do dragons speak? How do dragons speak? Let me show you. Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Here is how dragons speak. And look who wants to be spoken to this way. Isaiah chapter 30, verses 9 on to verse oh, 11. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, Prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. <clears throat> Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. <clears throat> Dragons associated here with Satan don't always speak in 
profanities and obscenities. No, no. Most of the time, they speak to you in a very soft tone, never raising their voice above that of a murmur or whisper. And they give a facade as if they are these soft, gentle old lynchmen who are so quiet, so peaceful. They speak smoothly, softly. They prophesy disease. That's how dragons speak. Yes, dragons can speak in profanities and stuff like that. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. But primarily, speak unto a smooth thing. Prophesy deceits. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spake, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth, and them which dwell therein, to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. <clears throat> and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, just like Elijah did, you know. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword and did live. Hmm. So, go now to Revelation chapter 20, verses 7, on to verse 10. Now, Second coming happens. We who go up come back down as his as the Lord's army at his second coming. Okay? See, in this dispensation, you go to the judgment seat of Christ, okay, whether you die or we get caught up. Those of us who go to the judgment seat of Christ at the second coming, we are coming back down with the Lord at his second coming. Okay? That's how that works. But, after his second coming, he comes down. He does what? Binds Satan for a thousand years on the earth. Uh, and, excuse me, in the bottomless pit. Excuse me. Hence, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, the kingdom of heaven. Now, that does not end, okay, the, the uh, Christ, uh, once he comes back at his second coming, he ain't going anywhere. Okay? But what happens? After the thousand years, after the thousand years, verses 7 on to verse 10, <clears throat> and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Okay? After the thousand years, Satan will be loosed. Okay? Alright? And see, during the kingdom of heaven, the thousand years, sin is still going to be on the earth, even though Satan is bound. Okay? Sin has yet to be totally erased. Okay? That's the thing. you got to remember about the kingdom of heaven. There is still sin in man and on the earth. Okay? Even during the kingdom of heaven. Scripture totally proves that. Okay? But after the thousand years, Satan is loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, <clears throat> to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. I've seen a lot of these Christians today trying to tie in Gog and Magog today. Gog and Magog is not applicable until after the kingdom of heaven. Okay? People, we have, we have a little while before the Gog and Magog thing 
of Scripture even becomes applicable. Okay? We've got quite a ways to go yet. Got at least the seven years of the time of Jacob's trouble and the thousand years of the kingdom of heaven. And after that, Gog and Magog. So when you got these people, it's like the drying up of the Euphrates thing. That is during the time of Jacob's trouble. After the redemption of the purchased possession, okay? That that does that's not today. See, again. These Christians who go to Revelation and try to bring stuff that's going to happen in another dispensation and try to make it relative for today. It doesn't work! Okay? Gog and Magog. Perfect example. The Gog and Magog thing you don't have to worry about today. You don't even have to worry about that during the time of Jacob's trouble. You don't have to worry about that during the kingdom of heaven. It's when Satan is loosed from his bottomless pit, his prison. Okay? <clears throat> Crazy. Anyway. <clears throat> and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the sea, the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hey Andy, you wicked filth. Okay? Lake of fire is eternal. Is eternal. You don't go there and burn a little while so then you change your mind and go, you, you go to hell, pal. You go to hell, pal. And the Lord rebuke you for picking on my brother. So, why do we look at this? Here we see your Trinity, Christian. The Trinity that you worship will be on the earth during the time of Jacob's trouble. And it is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Dear friend, the trinity is of Satan. And when your foundation is a three-person trinity, your foundation is sand, not a rock. Okay? Now, what about that foundation on a rock? <clears throat> Go to Acts chapter 17, one verse. God Head. Godhead. It appears three times in Scripture. Three times in Scripture. Acts 17, verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, meaning that God has created all of us, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Well, that just means trinity. Uh, no, it isn't. The trinity as defined by Catholicism, Christianity, is one God in three persons, which is nowhere in Scripture to be found. The only thing that resembles it at all, we already looked at in the book of Revelation, and it's Satan! Okay? All right? The Trinity Christian that you are following, that you believe is your little God, is of Satan. Okay? <clears throat> Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Verses 19 on to verse 21. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shewed it unto them. Okay? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Ah, oh, you atheists. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
because that when they knew God, just mentally, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So, Godhead. <clears throat> Again, this, this, this kills me. Atheist. Now you've got no evidence that God exists. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Now there will be, like I said in the description box, uh, very detailed videos where we go over this. Okay? Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verses 26 on to verse 28. God said, Let us make man in our image. Now, Look at, that, look at this verse. He's not talking about angels, and he's not talking to three persons. Okay? The Godhead, okay, the Godhead, which is what? Spirit, soul, and body. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. God is comprised of three. He has a spirit, he has a soul, he has a body. You and I are made in the image of God. We have a spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. Okay? You want proof that God exists? Look at yourself. You're not God, but you're made in the image of God, spirit, soul, and body. You are a person. Okay? <clears throat> this, this isn't hard to figure out. And God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the air, over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. And you guys who mess with gender, male and female created he them. There's only two genders. <laughs> So, we are made in the image of God. And the Godhead separate, separating from himself, right? Check this out. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 on to verse 3. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the capital S, Spirit of God, moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. There's the Godhead, right there, in the very beginning of Scripture. Not three persons. Not three persons, but God, that is the Father, the Soul, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and the Word, God said, okay, God said, the capital W Word. There's the Godhead right there in Scripture, in the first three verses. It's not the Trinity, okay, it's not at all, all right? Like I said, this, this is not rocket science. This is, you know, click, simple, simple, okay? So, when you got, and like back here in Romans, chapter 1, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now granted, some of us, when we look in the mirror, we're like, ah, but, but, evidence of God is yourself. You, we just looked at it. You are made in the image of God. You have a spirit. You have a soul. You have a body. Hmm. There's, there's your evidence. <laughs> there's your evidence. I, I would like to say that to that Mr. Dade Murphy, but like I, like I said about him, and I give him his credit for this. He, he doesn't want to believe the truth. Okay, He doesn't. He wants to go on being what the devil that he is. When he goes to hell, he'll know better. Okay, But I do. I, you know, I, I, I like to bring that up 
to to uh, quite a few of these um, <laughs> to these uh, atheists about law. Well, there's no evidence. It's like look in the mirror. You're saying I've got no, and then we just go through the whole thing we just did. Okay, but now, First John chapter five. Now, and this is interesting. This is interesting because. Christianity, especially from the bent of Catholicism, referred to 1 John chapter 5 as the, re the Johannian comma. And the Bibles remove 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Why does it do that? Because 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 specifically, tell you, Number one, that God is not three persons. He's not three persons, but God is one. Okay? That is why they remove it. Okay? That is why it is removed. And Christians, I have encountered, when you go to uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, these intelligent Christians, as trained by their Jesuit trained cemeterians, will bring up to you the Johannian comma. And then that leads into the nonsense about the oldest and best and blah, 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 blah. Okay? First John chapter 5, verses 6 on the verse 10. This is he that came by water and blood, natural birth. Even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the capital S Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. And, of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 especially, and the Lord is that Spirit. Okay? For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father the Word and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. Now, look at that verse. It does not say one in essence. It does not say persons. One. One God who is comprised of spirit, Holy Ghost, soul, God the Father, body, the Word, capital W, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. And God said, Genesis 1 3, God said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God said, Okay? God said, the Godhead in the first three verses of Scripture. Okay? And there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, meaning the Lord, the Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that Spirit. Okay? He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record God gave of his Son. The scripture. Colossians chapter 2. Then we will be done. This, one, this video is actually a little bit longer than I thought it was going to be. We, you know, like my brother brought up to me last night, uh, we're going to be talking about the dispensational, dispensational thing, of course. But, you know, most of the Christians that you and I are going to be in, encountering, brethren, are Trinitarians. And if 
that's your base foundation to what being a Christian is, you're, 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 you've blown it at the gate. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 on to verse 15. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built upon him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therewith, <laughs> therein with thanksgiving. Beware! <laughs> Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, Catholics, and not after Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Teaching people the Trinity is of the world, not of Christ. Okay? And like I said, you you look at that David Wood guy. Oh, that, that, guy, that guy's still around. That guy did a video, and that, it'll be in the description box for you to see. That guy did a video where he dressed up uh, in drag and put lipstick on. And he was, and that's okay. Huh? That's okay. The guy's the devil. The guy's a devil. Runs parallel with that wicked uh, cross-dressing Calvinist. <laughs> That's not funny. Like I told you, that 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 is not an exaggeration. I'm, I'm not going to mention that, that individual's name. I don't want to give that attention. Now, if that thing were to come at me, then I'd go full bore at him. But uh, I... I Leave that alone. That, that, that's disgusting. But anyway. For in him, who? Christ. Dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's a, that's a very significant phrase there. And here, what you do again, like you take, you take, your, take your little sharpie, and you take your little pen, verse. Okay? Godhead bodily. Godhead bodily. God, look, look, at the, look at the verse. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Spirit, soul, and body. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. One person. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. One person. One God. One person. One person. You and I are made in the image of God. We have a spirit we have a soul, we have a body, just like God does. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. Let's continue on to verse 15. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made with that's why you can eat pork today. Okay, you read 1 Timothy chapter 4. Okay, that's the doing away of the um, dietary laws. Okay? See, under the law, which was faith and works, if you touched or ate something, that circumcision made without hands was not there. Okay? Circumcision was in the male flesh. There, by the way... There is not one shred of evidence, not even, I, and I can't verify this, not even in the Apocrypha, is there any evidence anywhere to suggest female circumcision? You, have you heard about that? 
that there's such a thing as female circumcision? There, in script, there's nothing, nowhere, that even remotely suggests female circumcision. That, that's again another trick of the devil with feminism, trying to elevate the woman over the man. Okay, The covenant of circumcision was male, and it was the, of the male foreskin. Okay. Okay, you kids who, you know, get your kids away, got to mention this. You know what female circumcision is? It's the removing of the, on the woman. And I don't want to say it. I don't want to say it, but you, you know what I'm talking about. That's nowhere in Scripture. Nowhere. Nowhere. That is barbar barbarism. That is pure barbarism. That is vile to do that to a woman. Okay? But, see, under the law, during the patriarchal period, during the Garden of Eden, okay? During the time of Jacob's trouble, for except those 144,000 Jews during the kingdom of heaven that circumcision made without hands is dispensationally specific for this specific dispensation today and for the 144,000 Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble okay and see that circumcision made without hands is Christ in you. Okay? Hence, you can touch a dead body today and not have to worry about, you know, it affecting your soul. You can eat shellfish. You can eat pulled pork. And good, because pulled pork is awesome. Okay? You can eat these things. If you don't want to, that's up to you. But you can because when you come to Christ, and he saves you and seals you. That seal until the day of redemption is that circumcision made without hands. In putting off the body of sins. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is another one where, and this, and thankfully that this has been explained where people, you know, like to say, you know, well, they got, people got all up in arms when I pointed out that the scripture says that the flesh of Jesus was sinful. Uh, it was. And, and you know, uh, the one dear brother who got mad at me tried to rehash that up, and I'm like, dude, stop. Not even that putz from England doesn't even bother with that anymore. And if he does, I'll just simply put in the... Uh, uh, the um, community section, the videos the debunking that their stupid, ridiculous attacks. But here's another one that shows you that flesh is sinful. Okay? Buried with him in baptism wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened, made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses if you come to him on his terms. See, you come to the Lord on his terms and he saves you, he seals you, that seal is the Lord himself, that circumcision made without hands. Okay? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Okay? Dear friend, brother, sister, hopefully this will give you some ammunition on how to approach these Christians. Because their, their foundation, Christianity's foundation, 
is a foundation built on the sand. They're not rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, they're not. We're going to address that in Friday's video or maybe tomorrow. Lord willing, we'll see what he'll have done. That That is going to be addressed. Okay? But, like, like my brother brought up yesterday, it's like, you know, you, you got to rightly divide the truth, divide the word of truth, rightly divide it. If you don't, it messes everything up. It sure does. But, like he brought up, and this is true, which is why we did this video, if your base foundation is the Trinity, you, 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 you shot your foot out the gate. You're not, you don't even have the right God to begin with. <laughs> What? I mean, we gotta we gotta be steadfast in telling the people the truth. Absolutely, amen, amen, hallelujah. But if they don't have the right God, it's like no no wonder. No wonder. And remember, Brendan, we can't per se blame the Christian because because what is Christian today? It's Catholic. It's Catholic. It's fleshly. It's carnal. It's public opinion based and driven. It's satanic. It is not the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Your argument of what it once was is irrelevant to what it is today. Okay? So, Brethren, when you encounter Christians, first you need to establish in conversation what Christ are you talking about. Hmm? Be prepared. Well, the Christ of the Bible, we have just gone through some stuff in Scripture to hopefully help you. It's like, okay... Let's talk about the Christ that you think you're you're telling me about. Oh, what part? You got a NIV? <laughs> Look up First John chapter five verse seven in your NIV. It's not there. Okay. <laughs> There's a whole slew of verses that are not there, and they twist that and say, "The oldest." Oh, here we go again. Okay. Now. Not every Christian you're going to run into is, praise the Lord, a Trinitarian. That's good. That's, that's better. Okay? They're most likely not rightly dividing the word of truth anyway. But if you come across a Christian who is not a Trinitarian, that's better. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's one less thing that you really have to focus on before you can get to the other nuts and bolts. See, and, 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 and this, is, this is the thing. This is the thing. There was a time in the history of the church, the body of Christ, the church of the living God, where the God who is was taught. Remember, they say, well, the, the position of the church has always been the Trinity. You're talking about Rome. And Rome has killed those and done its best to destroy any of the evidence of other men who wrote against their wicked trinity. And you know what? You know who weren't Trinitarians? The Apostles. Uh, Paul the Apostle was not a Trinitarian. Okay. Uh, Peter, Catholic, was not a Trinitarian. There wasn't one solitary single apostle in Scripture who was a Trinitarian. So, that is going to be it for this video. A little longer than I thought it was going to be. But like I said, this, this, is, this is milk. This is nuts and bolts. And most of these Christians don't even possess this. So... That's going to be it for this video. I'm going to get this uploaded. 
Thank you for watching this if you do. I hope this gives you a little help on how to address these things and how to kind of deal with when you come across a Christian who's like, well, I'm a Christian and be a Christian is the follower of, be a follower of Christ. Uh, which one are you talking about? Which one? There's only one. Yes, but what does, and see, see, that's the mind control. That's the brainwashing that Satan has done to these poor people. And brother, sister, we have to fight against that until we're out of here. Okay? Very quickly, I have never once said that if you're a saint and you want to call yourself a Christian, I have never said that that means I think you're lost or something like that. No. I vehemently disagree with you and think you shouldn't use that, but are you lost because you foolishly want to fix yourself to that? No, no. But when you really examine, okay, and yeah, Christian appears three times, and every single context is a worldly context. Even the, the uh, one in Peter that you hang, cling to so much, okay? That's going to be for it for this video. I'm going to get this uploaded. Thank you for watching this. If you do, I love you, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.